Okay, so let's turn to St. Siloan's own writings and let's read Concerning Shepherds of Souls 399. As the Gospel tells us, after the Lord's ascension, the apostles returned to Jerusalem with great joy. The Lord knows what joy he gave them, and their souls experienced this joy, that they had known the true Lord Jesus Christ was their first joy. Their second joy, that they loved him. Their third joy, that they had known life eternal in heaven. And their fourth joy, that they desired salvation for the world as for themselves. And later on they rejoiced because they came to know the Holy Spirit and witnessed the workings of the Holy Spirit in themselves. The apostles walked the earth speaking to the peoples concerning the Lord and the kingdom of heaven. But their souls wearied and thirsted to behold their beloved Lord, and therefore they had no fear of death, but met death gladly. And if they were content to live on earth, it was only for the sake of the people to whom their love had gone out. The apostles loved the Lord, wherefore they feared no suffering. They loved the Lord, and they loved the people, and this love removed all fear from them. They feared neither suffering nor death, and for this reason the Lord sent them out into the world to enlighten men. And to this day there are monks who experience the love of God and reach out to it day and night, and they help the world by their prayers and writings. But this is the concern above all of the pastors of the church, whose inner grace is so exceeding great, that were men able to see the glory of this grace, the whole world would wonder at it. But the Lord has veiled it that his servants should not be puffed up, but find salvation in humility. The Lord calls his bishops to feed his flock and gives them freely of the grace of the Holy Spirit. It is said that the Holy Spirit established the bishops in the church and in the Holy Spirit they have the power to bind and to remit sins. And we are the sheep of the Lord's flock whom he loved unto the end and to whom he gave our holy pastors. They are heirs to the apostles and by the grace accorded them, they bring us to Christ. They teach us repentance. They teach us to keep the Lord's commandments. They proclaim the word of God that we may know the Lord. They guide us along the path of salvation and help us to climb the heights of the lowly spirit of Christ. They gather the afflicted and straying sheep of Christ into the church's fold, that their souls may find rest in God. They pray to God for us, that we may all be saved. As the friends of Christ, they are able to entreat and be heard of the Lord, attaining humility and the grace of the Holy Spirit for the living, forgiveness of sins for the dead, and for the church, peace and freedom from bondage. 
they carry the Holy Spirit within them and through the Holy Spirit forgive us our sins. By the Holy Spirit they know the Lord and like the angels they contemplate God. They are strong to tear our minds from the earth and attach them to the Lord. They grieve when they see us grieving God and preventing the Holy Spirit from dwelling in us. All the troubles of the earth lie on their shoulders and their souls are carried away with love of God. They pray without cease, beseeching comfort for us in our afflictions and peace for the whole world. By their ardent prayers they draw us too to serve God in a spirit of humility and love. For their own humility and love for the people, the Lord loves them, inasmuch as they continue in great toil and struggle, they are enriched by the wisdom of the saints, whose example they seek to follow in their own life. The Lord so loved us that he suffered on the cross for us, and his sufferings were so great that we are unable to apprehend them, because we love the Lord so little. Likewise do our spiritual pastors suffer on our account, although we often do not see their sufferings. And the greater a pastor's love, the greater are his sufferings. And we who are his sheep should understand this and love and revere our pastors. Brethren, let us dwell in obedience to our pastors, and then there will be peace in the world, and the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, will abide with us all. Truly noble is a priest, the minister at God's altar. Whoever gives offence to him offends the Holy Spirit who lives in him. And what shall I say of a bishop? To bishops is given great grace of the Holy Spirit. They are placed highest of all men. Like eagles, they soar aloft and there contemplate infinite expanse. And by their understanding of things divine, they feed Christ's flock. The Holy Spirit, we are told, set up bishops in the church to feed the Lord's flock. Were men to remember this, they would love their pastors even with a great love, and their souls would rejoice at the sight of a pastor. He who bears within him the grace of the Holy Spirit will know what I mean. A certain gentle and good man was out walking with his wife and their three children. A bishop riding in a carriage drove by, and when the peasant began reverently to bow to the bishop, he saw him in the act of blessing enveloped in a fire of grace. But one of you may ask, if the Holy Spirit established the bishops and governs them, how is it peace does not reign among us, and why do we not prosper? The answer is because we have wrong ideas about authority as established by God, and so we turn disobedient. But were we to submit ourselves to the will of God, we would soon flourish, 
since the Lord loveth the humble, obedient soul, and himself is her guide. But as for the disobedient soul, in his patience and mercy he waits for her to mend her ways. In his omniscience the Lord instructs the soul by his grace. The trouble is that we do not consult our elders who have been set over us to guide us, and pastors do not turn to God when they would know how to act. Had Adam sought the counsel of the Lord when Eve gave him to eat of the fruit, the Lord would have enlightened him and he would not have sinned. And for myself, I can say that all my sins and errors came about because in the hour of temptation and necessity I did not call upon the Lord. But now I have learned to entreat God's mercy and the Lord preserves me because of the prayers of my spiritual father. Thus is it with bishops and prelates. Although they possess the gift of the Holy Spirit, they do not have a proper understanding of all things. And so in the hour of need, they should seek enlightenment from the Lord but they act according to their own understanding, thereby offending against God's compassion and sowing confusion. St. Seraphim said that when he gave advice according to his own personal ideas, mistakes would occur. And mistakes can often be small, but they can also be big. Therefore we must all learn to find out the will of God. And if we do not try to learn, this path will never be known to us. The Lord said, Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. The Lord, through the Holy Spirit, enlightens man, but without the Holy Spirit not a single man can discern aright. Until the coming of the Holy Spirit, even the apostles were neither strong nor wise, so that the Lord said to them, How long shall I suffer you? The Lord gave his holy church pastors and they officiate in the image of Christ and to them is given power to forgive sins through the Holy Spirit. But perhaps you are thinking, how can this bishop or that spiritual father or priest possess the Holy Spirit when he is so fond of his food and has other failings. But I say to you, it is possible if he does not harbour evil thoughts, so that though there be some iniquity in him, it does not prevent grace from dwelling in his soul, in the same way as a tree in foliage may have some withered branches but they do no harm and the tree bears fruit. Or there may be tares in a field full of wheat, but they do not stop the wheat from growing. Concerning Spiritual Fathers At Vespers during one Lent at the monastery of old Rusikon on the hill, the Lord allowed a certain monk to see Father Abraham a priest monk of the strict rule, in the image of Christ. The old confessor, wearing his priestly stole, was standing hearing confessions, 
When the monk entered the confessional, he saw that the grey-haired confessor's face looked young like the face of a boy, and his entire being shone radiant and was in the likeness of Christ. Then the monk understood that a spiritual father ministers in the Holy Spirit, and the sins of the repentant sinner are forgiven him by the Holy Spirit. If people could behold in what glory a priest celebrates the divine office, they would swoon at the sight. And if the priest could see himself, could see the celestial glory surrounding him as he officiates, he would become a great warrior and devote himself to feats of spiritual endurance that he might not offend in any way the grace of the Holy Spirit living in him. As I pencil these lines, my spirit rejoices that our pastors are in the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we, the flock, though we have grace but in small measure, we too are in the likeness of the Lord. Men ignore this mystery, but St. John the Divine told us clearly, we shall be like him, and this not only after death, but even here and now, for the merciful Lord has given the Holy Spirit on earth, and the Holy Spirit lives in our church, lives in all virtuous pastors, lives in the hearts of the faithful. The Holy Spirit teaches the soul to fight the good fight, gives the strength necessary to fulfill the commandments of the Lord, establishes us in all truth, and has so adorned man that he has become like unto the Lord. We must always bear in mind that a father confessor performs the duties of his office in the Holy Spirit, wherefore we must venerate him. Know this, brethren, that if anyone should die with his confessor present, and dying say to him, O Holy Father, give me thy blessing that I may behold the Lord in the kingdom of heaven. And the confessor should answer, Go, child, and look upon the Lord. It would be with him according to the confessor's blessing. For the Holy Spirit, both in heaven and on earth, is one and the same. Great power lies in the prayers of a spiritual father. For my pride, I suffered much from devils, but the Lord humbled and had mercy on me because of my spiritual father's prayers. And now the Lord has revealed to me that the Holy Spirit dwells in our father confessors, wherefore I hold them in deep respect. Because of their prayers, we receive the grace of the Holy Spirit and joy in the Lord, who loves us, and has given us all things needful for our soul's salvation. Because of their prayers, we receive the grace of the Holy Spirit and joy in the Lord, who loves us and has given us all things needful for our salvation. If a man does not open his heart to his confessor, his will be a crooked path, that leads not to salvation, whereas he who keeps nothing back will go straightway to the kingdom of heaven. A monk once asked me, tell me, what must I do to amend my life? He was very fond of his food and ate unseasonably, 
So I told him, Write down each day how much you have eaten and the thoughts you had, and in the evening read out what you have written to your confessor. He answered me, I could not do that. So then he was unable to surmount the trifling shame of confessing his weakness, and thus he did not write himself, and died of a stroke. May the Lord pardon our brother, and preserve us from a like death. Whoever would pray without ceasing must have fortitude and be wise, and in all things consult his confessor. And if your father confessor has not himself trodden the path of prayer, nevertheless seek counsel of him, and because of your humility the Lord will have mercy on you and keep you from all wrong. But if you think to yourself, my confessor lacks experience and is occupied with vain things, I will be my own guide with the help of books. Your foot is set on a perilous path, and you are not far from being beguiled and going astray. I know many such who reason thus, and so deceive themselves. And they did not thrive because they despised their confessors. They forgot that the saving grace of the Holy Spirit is at work in the sacrament of confession. In such wise does the enemy delude those who fight the good fight. The enemy would have no men of prayer, while the Holy Spirit gives good counsel to the soul when we hearken to the advice of our pastors. Through the Father Confessor, the Holy Spirit operates in the sacrament of confession. This is why the soul, on leaving her confessor, feels renewed through peace and love for her neighbor. But if you are troubled when you leave your confessor, it means that you have not made a clean confession of your sins and have not in your soul forgiven your brother his transgressions. A confessor should rejoice when the Lord brings him a soul for repentance and according to the grace given to him he should heal that soul. Wherefore, he will receive great mercy from God as a good shepherd of his sheep. There are people who say that monks ought to be of some use in the world and not eat bread they have not toiled for. But we have to understand the nature of a monk's service and the way in which he has to help the world. A monk is someone who prays for the whole world, who weeps for the whole world, and in this lies his main work. But who it is constrains him to weep for the whole world? The Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, incites him. He gives the monk the love of the Holy Spirit, and by virtue of this love, the monk's heart forever sorrows over the people, because not all men are saved. The Lord himself so grieved over the people that he gave himself to death on the cross. And the Mother of God bore in her heart a like sorrow for men. And she, like her beloved Son, desired with her whole heart the salvation of all. The same Holy Spirit the Lord gave to the Apostles, to our Holy Fathers, and to the pastors of the Church. This is how we serve the world. 
And this is why neither pastors of the church nor monks should busy themselves with secular matters, but should seek to be like the Mother of God, who in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, day and night pondered the law of the Lord and continued in prayer for the people. It is not for the monk to serve the world with the work of his hands. That is the layman's business. The man who lives in the world prays little, whereas the monk prays constantly. Thanks to monks, prayer continues unceasing on earth and the whole world profits. For through prayer, the world continues to exist. But when prayer fails, the world will perish. And what could a monk achieve with his hands? Supposing he earned a rouble or two a day, what would that be to God? In the same length of time, a single thought pleasing to God works miracles. We see this in the scriptures. The prophet Moses prayed in his heart, and the Lord said unto him, Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? And delivered the Israelites from destruction. St. Anthony the Great aided the world by his prayers, not with the work of his hands. St. Sergius, by fasting and prayer, helped the Russian people to free themselves from the Tatar yoke. St. Seraphim prayed silently, and the Holy Spirit descended on Matovilo. And this is the task of the monk. And if a monk be lukewarm and indifferent, and has not arrived at a state wherein his soul continually contemplates the Lord, then let him wait upon pilgrim travellers and assist with his labours those who live in the world. This too is pleasing to God, but rest assured that it is not the monastic life by a long way. A monk must wrestle with his passions and with God's help vanquish them. At times, he rests happy in the Lord and abides, as it were, with God in paradise. But at other times, at others, he weeps for the whole world since his desire is for all men to be saved. Thus has the Holy Spirit schooled the monk to love God and to love the world. Perhaps you will say that nowadays there are no monks like that who would pray for the whole world. But I tell you that when there are no men of prayer on the earth, the world will come to an end and great calamities will befall. They have started already. The world is supported by the prayers of the saints and the monk's calling is to pray for the whole world. This is his task, and therefore do not burden him with earthly considerations. A monk must live in a constant state of abstinence, but if he is concerned with worldly cares, he will be obliged to eat more, and this is to the general detriment, because when he eats more, he is no longer able to pray as he ought to, for grace would have a lean body for a dwelling place. The world thinks that monks are a useless species, but this is not the right way to think. The world does not know how a monk prays for the whole universe. People do not see his prayers and how they are received of the Lord in his mercy. 
monks wage a vigorous warfare against the passions, and for this warfare they will be great in the sight of God. Myself, I am not worthy to be called a monk. I have spent over forty years in the monastery and count myself among those at the start of their novitiate. But I know monks who live close to God and to the Mother of God. The Lord is so close to us, closer than the air we breathe. Air must pass through the body to reach the heart, whereas the Lord lives within the heart of man. I will dwell in them and walk in them, I will be their father, they shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. Here lies our joy. God is with us and in us. Do all men know this? Alas, not all, but only those who have humbled themselves before God and put off their own wills, for God resists the proud and dwells but in the lowly heart. The Lord rejoices when we are mindful of his mercy and seek to be like him in our humility. Just as the hearts of Luke and Cleopas burned within them when the Lord walked with them on their way, so in our day the hearts of many monks burn with love for the Lord, and their souls, in lowliness of spirit and in love, cleave to the one and only God. But a monk with a predilection for money or possessions or in general for any earthly thing cannot love God as he ought, because his mind is divided between God and the things of this earth. And the Lord has said that we cannot serve two masters. And so the minds of them that live in the world are busied with the things of the world. Wherefore they cannot love God in the way that monks love him. Though a monk takes thought for earthly things, so far as is needful for the life of the body, his spirit burns with love for God. Though he labor with his hands, in mind he continues with God. The holy apostles preached the word to the people, but their souls were always with God, for the divine spirit lived in them and guided their minds and hearts. It is likewise with a monk. Physically, he lives in a small, Poor cell, but his spirit contemplates the majesty of God. He will keep a conscience pure in all things, careful lest he offend his brother in any manner, careful lest he grieve the Holy Spirit within him by any kind of evil impulse. He humbles his soul and by humility. He repulses the enemy from himself and from those that ask his prayers. There are monks who know God, know the Mother of God, too, and the holy angels and paradise. But they are also acquainted with devils and the torments of hell. And these things they know through experience. In the Holy Spirit does the soul come to know God, so far as this is possible. The Holy Spirit gives man, even here on earth, to know the fullness of the joy of paradise, which a man, without the grace of God, cannot endure, but must die. From such experience the monk wages war against prideful enemies. And the Holy Spirit is his teacher, enlightening him and giving him strength to vanquish them. 
The wise monk, by his humility, repels all self-conceit and pride. He says to himself, I am not worthy of God and paradise. I deserve the torments of hell and shall burn in fire for ever. I am verily the worst of men and unworthy of mercy. The Holy Spirit teaches man to think thus wise of himself, and the Lord rejoices in us when we humble and condemn ourselves, and he gives the soul his grace. He who has humbled himself has conquered the enemy. No enemy can come near the man who in his heart esteems himself deserving of eternal fire. No earthly thoughts find place in his soul. Heart and mind he lives entirely in God. And the man who has come to know the Holy Spirit and learned humility of him has become like to his teacher, Jesus Christ, Son of God, and resembles him. All we followers of Christ who are chosen of God, monks especially, are engaged in conflict with the enemy. We are at war and our combat continues every day, every hour. And the enemy will not get the better of the man who wants to subdue his own will. To defeat the enemy, we must learn the humility of Christ, and the soul that has acquired this humility has vanquished the enemy. But let us not despair, for the Lord is boundless in his mercy and loves us. By the grace of the Holy Spirit, God makes known to the soul the prayer which is in the first state the prayer which is in the second, and the prayer which is perfect. But even the prayer that is perfect, the Lord hearkens to, not because the soul is perfect, but because he is merciful, and like a loving mother, would cheer the soul that she burn still more ardently, and no rest neither by day nor by night. To be pure and unsullied, prayer requires inner peace, but peace cannot exist in the soul without obedience and self-denial. The Holy Fathers ranked obedience above fasting and prayer, since a man who knows not obedience may think of himself as a spiritual wrestler and man of prayer, whereas he who has excised his self-will and put himself under obedience in all things to his starit and his confessor has an unfettered mind. Pastors 2, on page 407, that first page, it's clear that pastors also should not be involved in secular matters, that they should not busy themselves with secular matters, but should seek to be like the Mother of God, who in the temple in the Holy of Holies, day and night pondered the law of the Lord and continued in prayer for the people. And we mentioned that story about the elder who sent two of his disciples to help a village that had lost its priest. The advice that he gave to the priest was that he should have always on his mouth the names of the people. And the monk, he advised to always have the name of God on his lips. So it's the same thing. But it does indicate a certain difference in the function of each. The, the priest is there to minister to the people, and the monk is ministering to the world. You see the, the great ministry that the monk has 
the importance of the prayer of the monk, but it's in a different way. He's calling upon the name of the Lord, praying for the salvation of the world as for himself, but he's not involved in the individual lives of the people the way that a priest is. Although, again, there's a certain point at which they converge again. If you take the examples, St. Porfirios, St. Paisios, St. Iacovos, there are so many who prove to be a great comfort to so many souls individually, as well as their prayer encompassing all the peoples of the earth. But again, the priest who's ministering to his parishioners one by one and who celebrates the divine liturgy as the people of God, not by himself, but with his congregation, he is praying for the whole world. And what St. Siloan says about the efficacy of the prayer of the monk, were there no more prayers such as these, the world would cease to exist. He says the same thing about the divine liturgy. When there's no more divine liturgy celebrated on the earth, then the earth would cease to exist. So you see, there are different functions, different differences in, in, in certain ways, but there are also points at which they overlap and coincide. But yes, the witness of the monk is the witness of the martyr. He's dying to the world. He has that death being crucified to the world. I am crucified unto the world, says St. Paul. That's the death of the monk. That's the death of the martyr, of which the monk is a continuator, the spirit of martyrdom. In his dying to the world, he is bearing witness to Christ, to Christ as the resurrection and the life. He's dead to the world in order to gain eternal life in Christ, which is the ultimate sacrifice. So a high calling, when we recognize the level at which St. Siloan sees the priest, the spiritual father, the monk, he sees the magnitude of the calling of each. And in his words, if you notice, although he tells it as it is, he's very encouraging, actually. These are inspiring words. He's not discouraging us, he's encouraging us. So I uh, mentioned that pastors should not be involved in secular matters. Pastors too not just monks, but you could say, well, that's obviously a monastic perspective, but I think that's something that we often fall into, the error of being involved in secular matters, and that is not the role of the pastor. I think that is important for us to bear in mind. The priest is not a social worker. Other people can do and should do social work, and works of charity, anything you do that alleviates the suffering of one's fellow man is blessed by God. But what the priest has to offer is something far greater. The priest has to offer that comfort of the comforter, which overcomes death and corruption. That's the ministry of the priest. And I think that that is sometimes forgotten in this world where somehow, I don't know if it's multitasking or we have this Superman impression of what a priest should be, a man for all seasons. We forget that the main task is to serve the people, to comfort the people, to inspire them, to follow Christ so that they overcome death and corruption. 
because that's what this is all about. And of course, if you alleviate the suffering of others, it's a beautiful thing and it's blessed. But you know that if you have a good meal, you're going to be hungry again. And if you wear clothes, it's much appreciated. But those clothes will grow old and they will need to be replaced. In other words, these are temporary things. The priest has something to offer that is on the eternal plane. And it's amazing how when we go to confession and we are cleansed of our sins and we feel that lightness of being and joy that comes from being purified and forgiven, and we know that God is present and he is with us and we lose the fear of death, this is what it's about. Because one day, sooner or later, we're going to die. So that's the focus, to be prepared for that. There's that story about a group of young people who were going for a drive and they came across the monastery of Osios David in Evia, of Greece. And they thought they'd stop off and uh, walk around the grounds of the church and uh, they, they, they had no clue about the life of the church. They were just teenagers who were having a good time driving around the countryside, enjoying life. And they bumped into this monk who was standing outside the church and he talked to them and they were, and he even held the hands of one of the young men and he talked to them about confession. He talked to them about confession and what a great gift confession is and that with confession all of our sins can be forgiven and we can be completely cleansed and freed from our sins and overcome our passions and what a great gift that is from God. And when they left the monastery, they didn't even go inside the church. They finished talking with him and they found out because they saw his photograph in a kiosk where they stopped to buy something to drink, I think it was. They saw the picture of the monk that spoke to them and they said to the person who was serving in the kiosk, oh, we just spoke with him. And the lady said, no, it, that's not possible. She said, well, he died 15 years ago. It was Saint Iacobos telling them how great a gift confession is. And this is what the priest has to offer. So, there are many points and we can only touch on just one or two. Click on the join button below our video and become a friend or reader of the Mount Tabor Academy. Support our drive to introduce the theology and spiritual life of the Orthodox Church to the wider community. Thank you.